it's rolling. Hello again. So today in this video, we're going to be looking at chapter six um, from our book for Psych 235, Early Childhood, The Social World. Um, so moving over away from the biology a little bit, and we're still going to have some of that, obviously. Uh, three elements kind of a thing, right, of, of every human being, psychology, physiology, and then the, the uh, social environment. We're focusing primarily on the social environment and its effects uh, upon our development. So, as always, listen for the four random facts. Uh, you'll then there'll be a quiz at the end of it to show that you took this or watched the lecture at least. Um, and PowerPoints are in D two L, just like normal. Find them in the same place you found this video, and we'll go from there. So, um, yeah, welcome. Hopefully, everyone's having a great day. Um, so let's see, let's get started. Chapter six, early childhood, the social world. I won't waste too much of your time, hopefully. All right, slide two, <clears throat> emotional development, part one. Um, so as we're, as we're moving through this, emotional regulation, effortful control, we talked about this a little bit in chapter five already, um, which is the ability to control when and how emotions are expressed. So if you watch a small child, Remember, and this is from the ages two to six, approximately is what we're looking at. If you watch a really small child, say two or three years old, um, a lot of times it, it's, it seems more like the emotions are in charge of the child rather than the child in charge of the emotions. As they move through this period, closer and closer to six or seven years old, give or take, again, there's kind of a gray zone of exactly when early childhood ends and, and, and begins. But you'll begin to see them actually taking more and more control of themselves, right? As the prefrontal cortex develops, uh, they, they, they get more and more control over their actions, their thoughts, how they process and deal with the environment around them. Um, so preeminent psychological task between two and six years of age is in fact this emotional regulation. Okay, this is the key. This is the thing that needs to be learned in this period, socially speaking. Um, Self-concept is also developed within this process. So you start to learn kind of who you are. You know, how do you respond to things? And you, you begin to show those things. You know, are you... Are you tender? Are you tough? Are you, uh, do you show lots of emotion? Do you like lots of activity around you? Or are you kind of quiet and shy and all those things? All of that is connected to this emotional regulation, um, which we develop in this period. So emotional regulation influences are going to be, these are the three things that basically cause it to form. Uh, maturation, which is, remember, the physical brain actually maturing, becoming physically more, more, uh, more, uh, more organized, I guess you could say, as I'm trying to organize my thoughts. Um, learning, this is through observation, um, like, like uh, you know, like observing human or grown-ups and things in the in different environments and kind of figuring out what works, what doesn't work. Observing your peers or your siblings, figuring out what works, what doesn't work, and then applying that to to your life. And then family and culture, kind of what's expected of you. Um, <clears throat> So, like for example, one 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 aspect of like family and culture would be like for me, um, when I would fall and you know bite the dust kind of a thing. Uh, a lot of times, my dad would say something like, you know, well, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Or you know, is it close to the heart? And I'd be like, no, it's my knee. And he'd be like, okay, you're fine. You know, you got two. All those kinds of things, which eventually taught me that you know, basically crying and stuff didn't really show me, didn't really get much done as far as for when I get physically hurt. Um, my mom was a little bit more caring. My grandmother, I would, if my grandmother was in the area, I would just burst into tears because I knew that I would get sympathy, right? And so because of that, it would be like, ah, if I did anything, it'd be like a tiny little scratch and I'd scream just in case. Uh, so yeah, so there's a, there, are, there are cultural and family expectations I felt as a small child that then carried into how I dealt with things. We kind of had that cowboy up mentality, right? Um, so yeah. And that was kind of a combination then of learning what I what I was taught, as well as family and culture, what works and what doesn't. Okay. Next slide, slide three, emotional development part two, initiative versus guilt. This is Erickson's third setting or psychological crisis. Okay, so his third point in the stages. Um, so children undertake new skills and activities and feel guilty when they do not succeed at them. Uh, protective optimism encourages trying new things. So if you've ever been around, again, if you've ever been around little kids, you very quickly hear them like, they'll be like, I'm the fastest kid in the world, or um, you know, I'm the best at this. And you hear that kind of phrasing a lot. Um, they always assume that they are in fact the best and no one is better than me until somebody comes better than them. They're like, you know, 
but that 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 optimism, that feeling that in fact they they are the best or that they can't fail, um, keeps them trying new things, which is super important in their development. Um, this optimistic self concept, um, it basically blocks them from feeling too much guilt. Now, this can be encouraged, which would generally is actually recommended. You don't want to necessarily be like, yeah, you're the best in the world, because they might be like destroyed if they get beat or something. But um, you know, encouraging them that they are in fact good and that they can get better. You know, like the more they practice, the better they're going to get. Um, if on the other hand, you know, they 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 do something and they fail, and you're like, pa, you know loser or you know make make fun of them or something um that usually will trigger that'll, that'll basically diminish that optimism and trigger that that sensation of guilt okay or shame so shame is basically uh the 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 emotion that's put upon us by others right you're shamed for doing things that we you know see as poor or whatever um guilt is what you feel when no one else is around and that's the internal voice um and so that's what Erickson feels like. This is that period where you're, you're learning what you're capable of, where your skills are, are lie, and you're beginning to kind of figure out who you are, right? The very, very basic level of kind of like, what is it that I'm, that I'm decent at? Like, what can I do better than other people? Um, and then, and, and or what are other people better at than I'm at? Then I, what do I struggle with, right? Kind of finding those things. Okay. Next slide. Emotional development part three, so slide four, uh, pride includes gender, size, and heritage. In fact, pride comes beyond even those things, but those are some of the basic uh, elements of it. Little boys are proud of being little boys. Little girls are proud of being little girls, right? They're, they're, you're proud of being tall. You're proud of being small. You're proud of being whatever. Uh, all of these are the factors that kind of make up who you are. It starts to become very important in this age. Uh, I think in chapter five, we talked about the 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 tendency of reading a book by its cover and and that's also going to be true with how, how they see themselves and who they fit with okay so it involves cognition that supports understanding of group categories One, early on as we get as as language gets developed we begin to categorize the world right um, boy girl is usually a pretty fast one for most little kids and they very quickly kind of segregate themselves um but they'll also be looking for, for you know, like grown-ups and kids. Uh, like they're looking for just any kind of group. Um, the most basic elements of science is essentially categorization, and that is what they are doing at this point. And trying to figure out where do they fit in the categories, right? Who's my team? Who's my clan? Who's my tribe? Whatever. That's what they're looking for. Um, and so as they begin to understand themselves, they begin to then apply those labels to people around them to see who is with me and who is in a different group, who's in a different camp, right? Um, which can then potentially lead to prejudice. Prejudice often involves feelings of superiority to children of other sex, nationality, or religion. If somebody else is, is from a different background, uh, then, then at that point, uh, you know, that they're going to be seen as inferior. So different means inferior to what I have personally. Going back to that kind of egocentric tendencies of, of these small children, um, if it's different than me, it must be worse, basically, is the thinking. Okay. Uh, this is a great picture. This is, you can also find this picture on page 195 in our book. Um, a little Peruvian uh, girl dressed in her traditional garb. And you can tell by the look on her face that she is just, you know, so proud of who she, who she is and where she comes from. Um, yeah, it's a great picture. It really does show it. Um, so, yeah. And that's an important aspect, right? Pride in this case, this is the pride like, like false pride. Right, you know, people get all braggy and stuff like that. You might see some of the elements of that when they're little, but this is a sense of kind of this, you know, understanding who they truly are. To some extent, right? Their brain isn't that developed yet, so they're still they're still learning that. But that sense of pride comes into that that state of of, you know, taking, I don't know, becoming happy with who you are, basically. Okay. Um, and that's that's going to be one of the jobs of parents. To kind of try to help them build that, while at the same time making sure that they don't become prejudiced, become judgmental towards others because they're different, right? Which is also a strong tendency of small children. Slide five, emotional development, part four, uh, brain maturation, the neurological advances. So the brain is going to continue to develop and get better, right? Growth of prefrontal cortex at about age four or five, like we talked about in chapter five. Um, myelination of the limbic system, where you, all that fat 
begins to pack in there and basically makes the brain more and more efficient. The electrical system is working more, is you're putting more rubber coating over the wires so that it's just like bah, everywhere um, within the brain. And, and uh, in, with that, you, you end up with improved behaviors and abilities. Prefrontal cortex is where all that processing goes happens. So as it develops, gets more efficient, gets more integrated with the rest of the brain, um, everything gets better, basically. Attention span increases. We talked about that in chapter five, some, I believe. Um, improved capacity for self-control is also a key one, right? The prefrontal cortex, and that's, we talked about that in chapter five. That's the reason why as adults, if you drink alcohol, you, you lose that self-control is because it's connected to the prefrontal cortex and the prefrontal cortex is affected um, more significantly than most parts of the brain. The whole brain is affected by alcohol, but the prefrontal cortex gets hit the hardest, the fastest um, out of the different elements. So, all right. <clears throat> uh, let's see, I got some notes just making sure. No, I think that's it. Slide six, emotional development part five, uh, emotional regulation and cognitive maturation developed together, each enabling the other to advance. Um, so, so as the brain is, is developing and getting better, you're also learning from your environment and everyone around you. And so those things combined together make you basically better, more and more in control of who you are. Um, maturing, maturation matters, obviously, if the brain isn't capable of it. That's why a two-year-old just, no matter how much you teach a two-year-old, they can't control their emotions very well, right? Uh, it has nothing to do with the fact that they're that you're like, I'm just a terrible teacher or something like that. It has to do with the fact that their brain is not capable of regulating their emotions at that level. So the maturation matters significantly. But the learning also matters, right? Um, are they being taught to deal with their emotions well? You know, like a lot of times little kids... Uh, if you've ever worked with little kids, not just your own, but like in a group, like in a preschool or something like that, um, there'll be some little kids, you're like, man, you're just a little stinker. And then you meet the parents, you're like, oh, I know why you're a little stinker, right? Like the, you can see how they're just modeling what they're seeing at home. Um, and so that becomes a big factor. And then culture matters. Like what is expected within the culture? Uh, let's see, what would be a good example of this one? Uh, okay, here, here you go. Uh, introvert and extroversion, Okay. It, it tends to be a little more biological. We talked about that in a previous chapter also. Um, extroversion being more, you, you need more energy in your environment. So oftentimes you produce more energy to basically get it mirrored back at you, hopefully. Um, if you're an introvert, you like it, things more quiet. Um, America, extroversion tends to be the go-to, right? It's preferred. Um, we're drawn to people who are extroverted. And so because of that, uh, people even little kids might start to, even if they're not naturally extroverted, they might start to show or put on a persona of an extroverted individual, right? They're more outgoing things than they might be otherwise. If you go to um, like Japan or, or South Korea or China, elements of South Asia, um, introversion tends to be held in higher regard, which becomes interesting. We'll talk about that more when we get to like adulthood because um, it can cause some interesting dynamics. But because of that, you can, you, children in those areas might learn to be more reserved, um, you know, more, more, more aware of the, the, what the thoughts of others and things like honor and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, those are some basic elements there of, uh, culture and how that affects us. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next slide. Before we go into the slide, first random fact. Uh, by the time they have been retired for two years, 78% of NFL players are bankrupt. And it's actually, they, it's, it's due to a couple things. One is a lot of times they're, they're, they're just bad money management is the main thing. But then after that, um, they, they're, they're broken to some extent. Their body is where they have a difficult time getting jobs after it. And a lot of them end up going through divorces. So yeah, 78% of NFL players are bankrupt uh, by the time they, uh, after two years after retirement, it's kind of sad, but okay. That was the random fact. Emotional development part six, slide seven, uh, motivation propels action and is derived from personal or social context, right? Uh, so intrinsic versus extrinsic, intrinsic, introvert, inside. Okay. All those kinds of things. Um, it's a drive or reason to pursue a goal, right? Same as extrinsic. Extrinsic is extroverted, exterior. Okay, all those kinds of things. Extrinsic, intrinsic. Intrinsic comes from inside. So intrinsic uh, motivation would be, I would do it because I just, I love it. I would do it no matter what. 
right? I would pay money to do it rather than, like, even if I don't get paid to do it myself. Um, music is a thing like that for me. Juggling, uh, to some extent, even farming and things like that. Like I, I love it. And teaching, honestly. Um, I love it. It brings me joy. I am intrinsically motivated to do these things. Um, so apparent and intrinsic joy, invent, uh, invented dialogues, imaginary friends, all of these things are going to be evident for children, right? They're not told to do it. They just do it. They make an imaginary friend. Um, they're going to be talking back and forth to themselves, and sometimes it sounds weird. Um, the fact that they're just kind of happy about life, right? The, 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 the enjoyment of playing and things are intrinsically motivated to do those things. Extrinsic motivated is going to be a driver reason to pursue a goal, just like intrinsic. But it arises from the need to have achievements rewarded from outside. Okay. Uh, grades are going to be a perfect example of an extrinsic motivator, right? Um, having somebody validate you externally and say, praise you in some way, shape, or form for the work that you do. <clears throat> um, as an adult, an example of this, an extra motivator would be like money, right? Most people don't work at McDonald's because they love McDonald's. They work at McDonald's because they need a paycheck, and that would be an extrinsic motivator. If you worked at McDonald's and you didn't get paid, but you just did it because you just loved it, that would be an intrinsic motivator, which is rare. I'm sure there are some people out there who do fast food that just love it, but I haven't actually met anybody that that's the case. So um, there you go. So extrinsic and intrinsic, right? Motivation propels action. It's derived from personal and social context. So some cases we do it because we get praised. Other cases we do it because we like just doing it for the sake of doing it. Slide eight, emotional development part seven. Praise. The distinction between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation is crucial in understanding how and when to praise something the child has done. Um, is it possible to overpraise a child? I'll give you a second to think about it. All right. The answer is kind of. <laughs> okay. If they're praised for absolutely everything they do, like you're like, you're breathing. Wonderful. Okay. Um, that... It, it loses its power. Okay. Um, effectiveness of praise. Basically, what, what makes good praise is when you do praise of a particular production and not the general trait. If I praise you for being, let's say, like I praise you, you're, you're so cute, okay, or you're so handsome, or you're so beautiful, or whatever, okay. Those things don't really do much. Um, things to praise... And you don't want to make it too complex either, right? Like you're like, oh wow, you did such a. You don't want to vague. So you're looking for you're looking for a specific, simple thing. It could be things like you say dinner time, and everyone, all the kid comes to the dinner table without uh, being asked the second time. And you can say, wow, you know what? I, I noticed that you came to the dinner table without me having to ask again. Thank you. Awesome job. Okay, that little praise buries itself in their head. You can know that you know that made it. You hit a point. You hit a good point because they'll smile. Okay, just a little, like, because you can see they're like, yeah, I did something good. Okay. Um, if they clean up without you asking them, wow, great job. Okay. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for, you know, thank you for not, I didn't have to even ask you. Just, you just picked it up. Great job. Those little reinforcements, that's effective praise. Right. It could be even like you observe, you know, they do something nice for another kid or something. And so you give them praise for that. Recognize that and say, wow, I noticed that you did this. Great job with that. You know, that's an excellent trait. Um, and so that's going to be what you're looking to praise. You don't want to praise just vague, like, wow, great job. I like how your room is clean. Okay, that doesn't do much. Give them specifics. I like that you that you cleaned your room without me asking, or that I only had to ask you once. Okay. Or that uh, you you stopped, you know, you, you started the wine. Did you notice when you started the wine? Yeah. Well, I like that you, you, you caught yourself and you stopped whining. Okay. Those kinds of things are going to be the kind of praise that are effective initially. Um, and then obviously, if they do something that's really good, right? Like they, they give you, a, a, they draw a picture and they're like, here's your picture, you know, praise that picture, good grief. Like give them, you know, like, I love how you did such and such a thing with this. You know, don't rip it apart. Because, um, and that, that will encourage them then to continue doing. You're, what you're doing there is reinforcing that natural optimism uh, in a good way. And you're building their pride in a good way with this. So specific praise for effort and not generalized statements are going to be thing. You're looking for the you're looking for specifics to give them praise for. You also don't want to praise things necessarily that are just intrinsically motivated. If the kid just loves doing a thing, 
they don't need praise, right? Like the joy that they get from it is, is all that they need. Um, and in fact, in some cases, extrinsic praise can kind of put a weird twist on it where, where they, they might not like doing it anymore. It's kind of like adults, uh, or it changes their kind of feelings toward it. What they're look, what the reason for why they end up doing the thing. It's kind of like adults who are like, I love fly fishing. And so they, you know, get a job becoming a fly tie or something. And then they're like, man, I hate this. Okay. Cause you, all of a sudden you have to do it or it's, it's externally motivated rather than intrinsically motivated. Um, so yeah, kind of think of that way. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. That's a, that, I, that could be probably just on that piece right there. You could probably do a whole class period on that and really dig into it, but quick run through. There we go. Slide nine, play part one. And I actually, I, there is a video in D2L on play and the importance of play. Um, so play is the most productive and enjoyable activity that children undertake. Um, and it's so important. Kids need to play. Right, like that. Oh, they just need to play. So play is universal. Actually, to some extent, actually, adults need to play. Uh, play shouldn't stop. It's not like just a thing that kids do. The play will change, but play is an important part of just a good, healthy life. Um, so play is universal. It has occurred for many thousands of years. Right, like basically, as soon, since there's been people, there's been play. Um, reported in every part of the world. Uh, doesn't matter where you go, you're going to find kids playing. And in fact, other parts of the world, you're going to find more adults playing. Also, uh, the more quote unquote primitive peoples, uh, like the Bushmen in, in southeastern uh, Africa, for example, and things, um, you'll find the adults engaging in play much more regularly than you find in, in America. We, we recreate, right, in America. We don't play, which is unfortunate, right? Recreation is great, but uh, just Letting yourself go and playing is it's such an important thing. So Vygotsky on play said that it makes children a head taller than their actual height. Uh, this image that's in this in this PowerPoint presentation or this piece you can find it on page one ninety eight. Um, and it makes the comment it says real or fake. You know you have a bunch of kids with with their superhero costumes. They know that they're fake, right? They know they don't really have superpowers, but. This is where that we talked about imaginative play and kind of that or thinking and magic thinking um, that occurs in this stage. When they're in deep play, it becomes very real to them. You might have memories of this if you think back when you were a little kid, right? Your games were just so vibrant. And that's because your mind basically kind of blurs the lines between what's reality and what is in your imagination. Um, and the power of imagination is incredibly strong in this age. It's incredibly strong all your entire life, but it's very, very dynamic in this early stage. Um, so you have a bunch, five little kids putting on their superhero pose, right? You got the Wonder Woman thing, like the Superman and all that kind of stuff. Um, this is a, it's considered sociodramatic play. This would be kind of play that where they're, they're, they're putting on a persona to see how it fits, right? Playing doctor would be, would be sociodramatic play. Uh, playing house, playing, I don't know, uh, soldiers, playing cops and robbers, all that kind of stuff. That would all be sociodramatic play. You're putting on a role, putting on a, a persona. To see how it fits. See if you like it. Um, and this children are going to do this fast. Our kids are just, this is just, you know, they don't have to think about it. It's just kind of there. Um, and it's an important aspect of who they are and how they play. Okay. Slide 10. Play part two, playmates. Young children play best with peers. So the smallest children, this is kind of an interesting thing. Most infant, right, play solitary or with a parent. That's just how they kick around. Got a little one-year-old kid. They're not going to really engage with other one-year-olds. It's just, it's not part of their fun. Um, they're going to play, you know, kind of exploring their environment to some extent or playing playing with the parent. Uh, and that'll be the case all the way up, you know, till about two-ish, two, two and a half. Um, it's kind of the go-to. Uh, toddlers slowly become better playmates. Initially, the play style is more, uh, you, you know, they'll play in the proximity of each other, but they don't actually play together. Young children are the first group that really begin to engage with other peers and really play with their peers rather than just playing near their peers. So peers provide an audience, role models, and sometimes competition, which all three of those things are important um, for our development as we push ourselves forward. Okay, slide 11, play part three, the historical context. So a century ago, families had more children and fewer working mothers, right? Average family size 100 years ago, uh, 
I don't remember the exact numbers, something like five. Uh, so you had more more kids, right? There's a lot higher chance of having, it wasn't unusual to have a family that would have like six, seven, eight kids. Um, and so you, there was a lot more activity happening amongst the children. And the moms were home, right? Um, historically. So there was at least one parent in the house all the time. Children played outside with neighboring children of several ages. So you had kind of these big mass conglomerations of kids from age you know, four or so all the way up through high school. Um, older children looked out for the younger ones. And the games allowed each, each child to play at their own level. Uh, and that's an important aspect, right? The games were, you might be playing baseball or something like that sometimes, but a lot of times you'd play like imaginative play. And it would allow you to engage with your peers or at least be observing peers or things like that. Um, but it differed from, from person to person, group to group, um, within the larger group that was all playing together. All right, type, so play, slide 12, play part four, types of play according to the part in 1932, um, which you can find on page 198, um, is four types of play. He had solitary play. Uh, and this, this can, these, all four of these types can be seen at basically, or I'm, uh, all five of these types, sorry. Um, all five of these types can be seen at pretty much every age level. But the older you get, the, the further into this you'll typically see happen more. So like young, young kids are kind of stuck in the top. The older you get, you might still play solitary play, for example, but you also might be able to do cooperative play when you're like 10, 12, right? Uh, but solitary play is a child plays alone, unaware of any other children playing nearby. Uh, if you've ever watched like a playground, you got the little kiddo that's like off in the corner playing with a truck or a doll or something by themselves, um, kind of off in their own little world. There, there could be a hundred kids playing around them, but they're, they're focused on the world that they've created here in the moment. Um, playing with a stick or something even, right? Pine cone, making a little pine cone farm or something. Uh, on looker play, a child watches other children play, right? You, a lot of times you'll see this with littler kids. They'll, they'll be observing uh, a game going on and you could be like, hey, you wanna come play? And they're like, you know, they, but they get joy and pleasure out of just watching the game happen. Okay. Um, they're, they're, they're absorbing kind of how the play works and how the game, how it functions. Um, parallel play, children play with similar toys in similar ways, but not together. You'll see this with toddlers and young kids a lot. Um, you know, like they're, they're, let's say they're all playing with Legos, right? You got like two or three kids playing with Legos, but they're doing their own thing. They're just kind of socially present with others, playing this kind of interacting in that way. They're not playing together. They're playing with or near each other, okay? Um, so yeah, associative play, children interact observing each other and sharing material, but their play is not yet mutual or reciprocal. Four-year-olds, a lot of times you'll kind of see this, they're beginning, right? They're interacting while they're playing, but at the same time, it's, it's you know, like, hey, are you using those scissors? No, here, you can borrow, you know, like that kind of stuff, but you're not actually engaging with each other. Uh, and then cooperative play, Children play together, creating an elaborate uh, in a joint activity or taking turns. Um, so this could be like official games like baseball or you know kickball or things like that. Um, it could be taking turns on the slide. It could be taking turns on swings or on a merry-go-round or something. I don't even know if merry-go-rounds are a thing anymore now that I think about it. But um, that was one of my favorite playground pieces of equipment. I think too many people hurt themselves on it, but probably why I liked it. Uh, <laughs> but... But anyway, um, it's that, there's an ability to actually engage with each other and truly play together, right? Um, so research on children today find much more age variation than Parton did. So Parton found like there was, there was a significant intermixing of all of these at every level. Okay. Why? Why is, it, why is there a difference? Why is there a difference from 1932 to today? Um, there's some different theories on why. The biggest one, though, is that 1932, right in the 1930s, is actually when public schools first became a thing. Uh, and families since then have become much smaller, right? We now have the average family size in America. If you don't include, if you don't include immigrants in the United States, um, we are below, we're below two, stu yeah, we are below two kids per family per capita um, in today's world in America, which, which means that most families 
have one kid, right? Or maybe two. So that, that basically in itself has isolated you. You don't, you don't have this intermixing of, of all these different ages and different levels. Then we stick them in a public school system uh, where we basically, they're, they're, they're confined to their age group, right? Kindergartners are with kindergartners and you rarely will interact with other groups. First graders are with first graders, second graders are with second graders and so on and so forth. So you're within a few months of each other age-wise basically um, for all intents and purposes for the most part in development. So with that, um, there's a couple of factors that are going to be happening, right? If I got eight kids, <coughs> uh, I, you know, then in that case, I, if one of them bombs, not literally, like I don't want them to bomb something, but if, if one of them was kind of, you know, well, I mean, it's terrible and it sounds cold, but psychologically I got seven others, right. That are, that are doing okay. That one could cause the adults, the parents stress, but They've, they've still got all this pool of kids to basically draw from. If I have one kid, and again, this sounds callous, but all of my bragging rights ride on that one kid. Okay. Like it or not, in the back of our head, we are living, like in our in our subconscious, right, our, that part of our brain that we're not really consciously aware of, but it's still there talking to us. Uh, we put ourselves into our kids. How our kids do reflects who we are and how we do. So therefore, that's why we take pride in our children lots of times is because it, in fact, our child is reflecting us. Okay. If I have one kid, that, there's a lot riding on that one kid. And so I got to be extra careful with them. Um, and so with, with that, I also have to be more careful, right? And just in general. So you're going to find when they even are just playing, a lot of times they're going to be inside. You might have a play date, a play date or something like that. A lot of times they're not going to be just running around, you know, with a bunch of kids from the community or whatever. Um, the idea of like go outside, just get out and play. Uh, you rarely hear that, right? When I was a kid, and I grew up in a small community, so I, I knew everybody basically, and everybody knew me. But uh, you know, me and my friends, we'd we'd I'd be like, "Bye, mom. See you at dinner," you know, whatever. And, or my mom would just be like, "You're driving me nuts. Get out of the house. Come back when it's dark uh, in the summertime and the like." And we'd run around, you know, get in the creeks and get in trouble. Um, we always got caught. We never, I don't think we ever got away with anything. It's a small community. Everyone knows you. Everyone gets you, gets you. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, you know, everything from catching fish in the creek and crawdads and things like that to, um, uh, making mud forts and tree forts and, you know, finding one of our dad had a machete and we'd go through and like hack a, hack a, uh, fort in the bushes, things like that. Just kind of rum, rough and tumble play, um, out about a bunch of other bunch of other kids from different age groups and things running together. Um, you don't see that as much today, right? There's lots of stranger danger type stuff. That was just kind of starting to be a thing when I was a kid. Um, and so, so, uh, but that's a lot more on people's minds today than it was then. So there's some differences there. And then you go back a hundred years and it's even more so, right? Like that you have a bigger family. I came from a family of two. So we had, uh, smaller family comparatively, but, um, yeah, that's the kind of stuff you're looking at. Some of the differences. Okay. Sorry, that probably took longer than you. You're probably like, good grief. Okay. Slide 13, <coughs> uh, play part five, social play, two general kinds of play. we got solitary and we got social. That's basically it, right? Like, duh. <laughs> solitary play, you're playing by yourself. Social play, it's two or more people playing together. Um, it's a form of play changes with age, cohort, and culture. And basically what you're going to find is, is it's going to look a little different. Uh, different groups are going to have different uh, aspects to this, right? Um, got an image here. I think it's just the book. Yep, on page 200. It's that social play, right? A couple kids playing video games together. Um, they're engaged, right? They're both smiling. They're both laughing. The younger child is like getting social cues from the older child. You can tell because he's like observing his face, right? Um but the, the laughter and everything shows that these these are these are kids that are engaged with each other in a positive sort of way. Social play. Okay. Older you get, the more social play becomes a bigger and bigger part of your life and more and more important. Uh, little little kids at social play, it's important, like right? they need it, but it's not like it's not a driving factor. By the time you're seven, eight, nine years old, a lot of times you want to play with your friends more than you want to play with your family or your 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 parents and stuff like that, right? So um, and you need to. That's part of growing up. So, 14. Play part six, rough and tumble play. 
Uh, mimics aggression through wrestling, chasing, or hitting with no intention to harm. And that's going to be a key factor. You'll see this with, with pets and cats, right? Dogs and puppies and stuff. When they're growing up, they play this. Cats, kittens will we'll rough and tumble play. Um, even sheep and pigs and cows and bears and everything else. Um, it's a way of practice, basically, and to learn where your social lines are. Like, where's the line that you can cross and how far or how close can you get to that line without crossing it? Um, contains expressions and gestures such as play face. So there's, there's a, we, we have expressions when we start to like wrestle that will show that I'm not actually wanting to hurt you. Right. If I was going to like try to actually hurt you, my, my, the face like squares up, right. You show anger, um, jaw tightens, uh, eyes kind of squint, focusing your attention. A lot of times the, the, the nasal passage will open. So like, you know, you, you get all the kind of, it almost looks like disgust or, you know, kind of anger and combined in there. Play face is like, you, you might look the same posture, but the expression is, is much different. You're like, you got a kind of a, you know, quirky look on your face uh, that lets the other person know that you're not actually wanting to hurt them. Uh, now, if you cross the line, all of a sudden that, that play face can turn into a real fight. Like you see that happen a lot of times with kids. But, uh, but it's it's still it's, there's those gestures and things that let you know we're just pretending, right? Like we're not. I'm actually I'm not. You're not trying to hurt me. I'm not trying to hurt you, kind of a thing. Um, so it's particularly common among young males. You're going to find rough and tumble play much more common in young males than young females, in every species, um, not just humans. Uh, it advances the children's social understanding. It's important. So it's 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 exceptionally important for young males. Uh, to engage in rough and tumble play, but it's also very important for young females to also engage in rough and tumble play to some extent, um, because again, it gives you those social boundaries of, of how far you can push and not push and things like that. Uh, it advances children's social understanding, but increases likelihood of injury. Pretty much every time I got hurt as a kid it was because of rough and tumble play. A lot of times with my dad, uh, which is also a common thing. May positively affect the limbic system development. The limbic system in the brain basically a lot of times be it's uh, stimulated in a way that is good rather than damaging. And so, so rough and tumble play allows it to basically, again, you get more social and emotional regulation um, with rough and tumble play. Oftentimes, there's going to be three elements to rough and tumble play. One, when they're littler kids, uh, this doesn't count as the three elements. One of the, one of the things actually also is that if you have a, a, a dad in the family, the dad is much more likely to engage in rough and tumble play than the mom. Just like little boys are more likely, Big boys are more likely also. Uh, and so if there's a dad in the home, you're much more likely to see rough and tumble play where it's between the kid and the dad. It's The dad's also more likely to help them learn their social boundaries or the, 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 where the line is. Um, because moms, if the kid hurts the mom, moms will typically keep playing. If the kid hurts the dad, and they did big, they did a giant study on this. They had like 300 and something families that they did a study on. When a kid, when the dad gets hurt, the dad's like, I'm done, game over, right? And that actually is a good thing. That they game over moment teaches the kid that like, okay, it, when this happens, the game ends. My fun is over and I don't want that to happen. And so therefore, next time I got to make sure that I don't do that thing, right? Same thing happens when kids play with kids. You have, you know, a kid hurts another kid and it's like, oh, game over. You have the like, oh no, no. Panic mode, don't cry, it's okay. Like, look, I'm hurting myself too, you know, kind of a thing. Uh, all of that is gonna be part of the rough and tumble play with other kids. But uh, what you need, you need you need some elements, right? You need ample space. You gotta have enough room. If you don't have enough room, you get the like, get out of the house, because uh, you know, you're rough and tumbling in the living room or something. Uh, you need the adults to be at least apparently distant. You need some space from you and other grown-ups, right? Initially, it might be engaging rough and tumble with your parents, but uh, as you're as you're engaging rough and tumble with your peers, the, the you need a, a absence of adults, um, and then you need friends. If you don't have friends, you're not going to be able to rough and tumble with anybody unless you have a parent, like I said. But uh, but those three elements, right? You got you got enough space around you to actually do it. You got some space between you and the adults, and you got some friends nearby that you can engage in this kind of play. Um, important factors. Okay. Slide fifteen. Play part seven, uh, sociodramatic play. I mentioned this a second ago, but it allows children to act out various roles and themes in stories that they create. Right. Uh, this is a great picture, really. It's uh, 
<laughs> it really is. It's awesome. You have a little girl, right? Um, look, if you look at the, her background environment, she's probably kind of from a little bit of a rough, lower income background, but she's like joy personified. Uh, and she is fully engaged. The, the over dramatic gestures and stuff show that she is fully engaged in a sociodramatic play. So sociodramatic play allows children to act out various roles and themes and stories that they create, right? So they're able to do play doctor and things like that. That'd be a basic level of sociodramatic play. As they get older, the stories get more and more complex. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of like some story things. My sister and her friend used to always play that they were orphans and they were trying to escape the orphanage for some reason or other. And they had to go like survive in the woods or something. Um, so that would be an example of social dramatic play. You create a story and you're a character within the story that you're playing through, right? Playing, playing soldiers, cops and robbers, all those kinds of games are, have some element of social dramatic play. Um, so social dramatic play enables children to explore and rehearse the social roles. They want to see what they're good at, what they like, if they like it or not, right? Um, playing house, uh, playing doctor, playing fireman, playing cops and robbers, playing chef, you know, all these different things. Um, are, are elements of kind of putting on a mantle, seeing how it fits. Uh, it allows them to test their ability to explain, and in fact increases their ability to explain, because they have to let the other kid know like how the story is progressing, so they need to give instructions. Um, they practice regulating their emotions, right? It also allows them to practice putting on emotions. So uh, as the image shows here, like again, page 201, if you want to see that picture, if you don't have the PowerPoint. Um, the larger than life expressions are gonna be a common factor. It's almost like watching an opera, right? A bunch of kids on stage or a Shakespeare play or something where the emotions are big. The bad guys are really bad and the good guys are truly good and like there's no black and white and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, when you're sad, you're just really sad. When you're happy, you're, you're up and ready, you know, kind of a thing. And all of those things are, are basically practiced and they can kind of see how the emotions, again, fit and look and feel and they can experience them in a safe environment, right? So I can experience anger while in control and in an environment that it, it can be tested, okay? Which again, increases our ability to develop our self-concept and kind of where we fit, how emotions fit with us and things like that. Um, so sociodramatic play is, is very important. All play is very important, which we're the end story, that's the answer. Um, 16, slide 16, play part eight. Good over evil or evil over good. So boys everywhere enjoy strongman fantasy play as this continued popularity of Spider-Man and Superman attests. Man, Marvel, they just like, they, they tapped into this element of, of our like internal desire for play. Uh, we like to have a hero, right? Uh, and we generally like to have it pretty cut and dry. Like, like the reason why John Wayne was a big deal in the you know, 1940s, 50s, and 60s, 70s, um, Obvious good guy versus obvious bad guy. And we like that. We like that cut and dry, especially as kids. Um, these boys follow that script. Both are Afghan refugees now in Pakistan. So that, you know, they're, they're, they're playing out what they've been seeing for what they see as good guy, bad guy. Um, interestingly, I had a friend who, who, was, who grew up in inner city, uh, New York. And he was on the rough side of the law. Uh, his family was. And... They would play cops and robbers, but the good guys were the robbers in his stories. Um, and the, the bad guys, nobody wanted to be the cop because the cop was the bad guy. And so kind of the good, who's good, who's evil can, can look different in a given, again, that's going to be the cultural expectations, right? But hero play is going to be a big, a big part of, of play, especially for boys. This kind, of, this kind of good versus evil is more common with boys than girls. It doesn't mean that girls don't play it. It just means that boys are more likely to engage in this uh, kind of play. Okay. Play part nine, slide 17, learning by playing. Uh, 50 years ago, the average child spent three hours a day in, the, in, in outdoor play. Okay. Across the board. doesn't matter where you are in the, on the country, in America, th uh, three hours a day. From zero to eight years old. Okay. That's the span. Uh, today, video games and television have largely replaced that, especially in cities. Uh, if you don't have a place to get outside, you're more likely to be stuck inside because of that you gotta fill it with something, right? So children seem safer if parents can keep an eye on them, but what are they learning, right? 
look at rough and tumble play, sociodramatic play, the good versus evil kind of hero types of play, um, even even just basic social play, right? It, it requires this space. It requires basically that opportunity to for kids to engage with kids um, without direct parental supervision. Is it safe? Depends. But is it as safe as being inside? No. Right? There's some element of danger. And that actually is a good thing. That element of danger uh, is an important aspect of the development of the individual. Because you learn, again, you learn where boundaries are and things like that. Um, Long-term effects on brain and body may be dangerous today is what we're looking at with the, with the increased screen time and the lack of outside play. Um, like, I mean, look at, when you look at the stats here, right? Um, you can find these stats also on page 202. The amount of time just spent with screens has just increased dramatically. Just over, like from 2011 to 2017 even, there's significantly more time spent on screens. Um, well over two hours a day on average. 2013, you had a little blip. I'm not sure why, but um, one of those interesting little things. Um, but yeah, so this that's time when basically they, they are not world exploring. They're not creating their own world. They're not developing their imagination. If I'm playing a video game, the video game is, might be amazing, right? One of my very favorite elder or, or games is, is Skyrim. Um, I haven't played it for years, but I, I loved that game when it came out. Uh, the world's incredible. <clears throat> the problem with it when it comes to actually like play is that it's a world that has preset rules. It has very little room for imagination. You're, it, you're working within a, a preset game mode, right? Uh, versus like socio uh, dramatic play where you are the creator of the world that you are living in in that moment, right? There might be somebody else involved too, helping along with it, but you're the one who comes up with the rules. You'd be like, you can be any superhero you want, but you only get like two powers. And so therefore, you know, what are your two powers? Okay, and you'd like all, all those kind of things, right? That's sociodramatic play. Um, you set the stage, you build the world inside your head. Video games and television and all these, it, it might be imaginative types of stories, but it doesn't allow your imagination to grow. Even like television compared to books, right? Uh, or even maybe like audio dramas might be better because it, it forces you to use your imagination in some way. So an audio drama would be like, well, it's what it sounds like. It's a, you know, a, a show that's that's put into just audio book format or, or you know, just the voices and sound effects. But it allows your mind to create the images uh, for it. That's so much better than screen time. Screen time has been proven to be very detrimental to development, especially for small children. Um, Kids under the age of four really shouldn't have any. Under the age of two, basically, everyone says they should not have any screen time whatsoever. I would argue up to the under the age of four from different research I've looked at. Um, but under the age of, of eight, they should have very limited screen time, if any, right? And by limited, I mean like 30 minutes tops a day of screen time. Two and a half hours, that's too much time on the on you know computer, television, tablet, phone, whatever. Okay. The other thing is you look at, gotta look at like what is the what is the kind of media that they're that they're digesting, right? What what is what are they feeding themselves with? You look at most shows, man, the the the, the stereotypes that are crammed down our throats, um, the violence, the sexuality, and all these things that are just inappropriate for children. Uh, but it's there; it's just kind of present and and constantly getting crammed down our throats from our society. Um, it increases chances of racism and, and sexist stereotypes and all these kinds of things if they are observing those kinds of shows uh, in this early stage. Not to mention like what you can accidentally find on phones and things. Um, you know, the, the, the adult content is just disgusting. Um, and so, yeah, you gotta be super careful with that stuff for kids. Okay, random fact number two, and I should actually probably use this in chapter five thing. I think we talked about left and right-handed in chapter five, but we're gonna use it here instead. Um, cats are also right and left-handed, but right and left pod, I guess. Um, females tend to be uh, to favor their right paws, and males tend to, fa to, to favor their left paw. And there you go, weird. There's actually some other animals that are also tend to have a right side or left side dominant um, tendency, but again, humans for the most part, right-handed. Cats, if you're female, right-handed, right pod. If you're male, left pod. Weird stuff. 
Okay, slide 18, challenges for caregivers part one. So we're moving out of play. Um, some styles of caregiving. So parenting styles vary within nations, ethnic groups, neighborhoods, even families, right? There's, there's as many parenting styles as there is parents basically in the world. Um, <clears throat> Baumrin's categories, he, he kind of looked at what are the bigger, the overall arch, overarching uh, ideas of kind of the, the driving factors in parenting. And he felt like there was there was four key four key aspects that will that would differ with us. Um, you can find this on page two hundred three if you're kind of wanting to like highlight in your book or whatever. But um, so Baumrin's categories: parents differ in four important dimensions. Um, expressions of warmth. You know, are you in a family that shows a lot of warmth and, and affection? Are you in a family that's relatively cold? Do you do you do you hear I love you regularly, or did that was that word like almost a you know a no no word in your in your family? Um, do you get hugs, no hugs, snuggles, no snuggles, all that kind of stuff, right? And how do you show it? Like maybe maybe you're verbally very loving, but you don't show any physical affection, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah. Then strategies for discipline, right? How do you do it? Do you do anything? Do you do too much? Too little? Not enough? Do you do timeouts? Do you do spankings? Do you do grounding? Do you like all those kinds of things, right? Um, communication. Are you are are you um, are you a good listener as a parent, or do you just talk at your kids, um, or do you talk with them and engage both ways? Because some people are really good listeners, but they're terrible at communicating themselves. Um, other people, all they do is communicate, but they never they never stop and listen back. And some people are in between, so they're looking at those things, and then expectations of maturity. Um, what's expected you at a given age differs significantly from family to family, right? Um, okay, for example, when I was 10 years old, uh, my mom taught me how to do my own laundry. So I started doing my own laundry when I was 10. I had friends that had already been doing it for a couple of years. They'd been doing laundry even they were like, since they were like seven or eight. Um, I had friends in college who had never done their own laundry. If you have kids, make sure that they learn how to do their laundry before they go to college. Like that's ridiculous. But, um, but that's going to be the difference in maturation, right? Like, or expectations of maturity. Uh, like, there's going to be certain levels of, of, of expectations put upon your child. How much do you give them? How much are you expecting of them? So on the basis of these dimensions, he felt, figured there were three parenting styles were identified. The fourth style was uh, suggested by other researchers. So we're going to dig into those here. Slide 19. Um, challenges for caregivers, part two. Bomber and styles for caregiving, and you can actually find there's a little like table thing in the book on page 203 down at the bottom um, with more in-depth explanation of it above it. But authoritarian parenting is going to be one. It's high behavioral standards, strict punishment of misconduct, and little communication. Um, here's the rules. They know the rules, right? I expect you to maintain the rules. If you break the rules, you get punished, and it's usually... Uh, relatively swift punishment. This is going to be also where the parent oftentimes it's talking at the child and not listening back very much. Okay, permissive parenting. So that's one one side. Permissive parenting is kind of the, the swing to the other direction. You have high nurturance and communication, right? Lots of lots of communication, lots of talking, but there's very very little discipline, um, guidance, or control. And again, this is this is Baumrin's research. Okay. Uh, and then you have authoritative parenting, which parents set limits and enforce rules, but are flexible and listen to their children. So they're kind of the middle ground. Okay. Um, the fourth one, the fourth one that is that was suggested, um, is actually just neglectful parenting or uninvolved parenting. So this is the parent that like they the kid is present, but they're basically not right. Like they're they're they're, they're not engaged. So they're they're they're. Um, Communication would be low both ways, but expectations are also low. Um, so it, it, it can lend itself to actually being um, harmful to the child because of the, the, it ends up being like neglect for the most part. Okay. So you have three different forms, right? Which one would you want to be? And most people would say authoritative parenting, right? Authoritative, not authoritarian. Authoritative parenting looks the best. It's the middle ground. That's the way to go. Um, there's some there's some hiccups though with that. When you look at it just in this cut and dry thing, that, that seems like the obvious answer. Um, but some things that Bomberin didn't take into consideration. That's where you're going to find on slide 20 
Um, challenges for caregivers part three. The original sample had little economic, ethnic, or cultural diversity. It was basically a bunch of kids, white boys, about around age 10, that he initially did his, and they're in a they're in a higher end school. Um, so it was it was a pretty high, you know, they were all from the basically the same background. Uh, more focus was on attitudes than on daily interactions. So they were looking at he was looking at kind of what is the attitude of the parenting rather than what does it look like in the individual family. Uh, there was no recognition that some authoritarian parents are very loving toward their children, right? Just because you have strict rules and reinforce them deeply doesn't mean that you're a terrible person, okay? And some kids actually thrive in an authoritarian parenting style. Some kids need those strict guidelines, and they function very well in that, okay, if the parents are also loving. The big issue there is, 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 is with when communication fails, right? When, when they're really, um, that can cause issues with the, with the parent-child. Um, it's glitched. I hope it's working. Okay. Uh, there was also no recognition that some of the permissive parents, so, so you kind of picture like, like, like the authoritarian parents are kind of like the Nazi parents and the permissive parents are the like, you know, like granola kind of hippy dippy parenting okay it's kind of the, the the stereotypes that are almost painted by these um but he showed the thing that he didn't look at with the permissive parenting style um is that oftentimes permissive parents are, are highly engaged with their kids and even though they don't discipline their kids they don't do timeouts necessarily or they don't do you know spankings or things like that um they guide their kids actively okay so they use words instead of rules to basically guide the action. So there might be like, there's no rule, specific rule that says you can't do this. But if you do that, they'll be like, so was that a best choice? Okay, kind of a thing, and you kind of engage them in that way. Um, and then they also don't look at the child's contribu uh, contribution to the parent-child relationship. He didn't, he just overlooked that completely. So that's some of the big the big uh, issues that that we have um, with his research. His, his three parenting types are actually pretty Solid, like those three are really, that are legitimately the, the three main areas. It, it's kind of a sliding scale. You fall somewhere between them a lot of times, um, but it's gonna be there. The biggest issue though is just that he didn't look at the complexity of what a human family is, right? Uh, he tried to make it too like cut and dry. And so that makes it an issue. Because again, some kids are gonna function exceptionally well in a permissive household or an authoritarian household. Um, other kids are going to want that, uh, that authoritative uh, household, that kind of middle ground. But it, it's going to be a kid from kid by kid, right? One kid in a family might do amazingly well with, with permissive parents, and another kid is like, man, it just doesn't do it. Like, he needs rules. Um, another kid needs rules while his sibling doesn't. His sibling wants just kind of like, you know, just show me why it's wrong or, or things like that. Um, so just as there's, there's lots of different ways of learning and things, there's also lots of different ways of making a family function well. Okay. In all the categories, though, I would say uh, uh, communication is going to be a key aspect, right? You want uh, relatively high communication both ways for a best case scenario. Okay. 21. Challenges for caregivers, part four. Uh, discipline. So punishment rates increase dramatically from infancy to early childhood. If you are punishing your one-year-old, you're don't do it. Like that's just a it's a poop head move, okay, to use my son's expressions. Um, if it's a, like a one-year-old, a little infant, punishment is not the way to go. There, there's, there is no need for discipline at that age. Correction, yes, not discipline, right? Timeouts and spankings and all that kind of stuff just don't, they're not effective at all for helping a one-year-old or even a two-year-old um, with, with understanding things. Now, as you move out of two, okay, like or into your twos, you're going to find like there's all there's a significant increase then of discipline becoming a thing because it begins to actually be effective. It's it it, it is it is usable. Okay. Most parents have several methods of discipline. There's very you're going to find very few families. It's like this is how we discipline and this is always how we discipline no matter what. Um, I knew one family that was the case. Every kid had had to sit on the uh, stairs if it, wherever they were at. They would find a stair and have them sit on it if they got in trouble. Um, right. And so then this, there's, there's, there's a ton of categories there, right? You can do timeouts, you can do cool downs, you can do spankings, you can do 
I had a, a friend that his <laughs> his mom would wing shoes at us. Uh, she had flip flops, and they just woof come flying out of nowhere. Uh, I had another friend that his mom pinched like that, and this would be physical or corporal punishments. Okay. Um, yeah, lots of debate there. We're going to look at that more in depth in a minute. But uh, this, so physical punishment is going to be discipline technique that hurt the body of someone from spanking to serious harm, including death. At its most extreme, um, the physical punishments can be can be brutal if the family comes from like if there, there's there's some issues, some serious issues in the family. Don't beat your kids. Okay, that's going to be flat out the, the first rule I would, I would say on all any kind of form of discipline. Do not beat your child. And if you're going to use physical punishment, don't do it in anger. Okay. Um, there's a lot of debate over whether or not physical punishment should ever be used. But uh, if you are, if you choose to use it, don't do it in anger. I've talked to parents that like, you know, they spank their kids regularly or whatever. And a lot of times I'm like, you know, why do you spank? And they're like, it makes me feel good. Like it basically makes me feel like I did something about this negative, you know, uh, outcome for the, that the kid is doing. So it's more for the parent satisfaction than for the actual good of the kid. And I have, I have a lot of, there's a lot of debates there. So anyway, I'm going to go more in depth now in just a second. So slide 22, challenges for caregivers, part five. Spanking opinions are influenced by past experience and cultural norms. Um, so what does the research suggest? So uh, let's see, on page 205, there's a little list there. So here's some of the things that you're going to find. Spanking is going to be more frequent if uh, you live in the southern United States compared to New England. Okay, more more Southerners will spank than New Englanders. Um, mothers will actually spank more often than fathers. Uh, conservative Christians are more likely to spank than non-religious families. Uh, African Americans are more likely to spank than European Americans. European Americans are more likely to spank than Asian Americans. Um, U.S.-born Hispanics. Are more likely to, to spank than immigrant Hispanics, and lower socioeconomic families are more likely than higher socioeconomic families. Now these are general generalities, right? These are like statistically. You could be a a kid from New England whose father raised them from a non-religious background who is Asian American um, and from a high socioeconomic like family, and gets sp spanked all the time. And you could be the flip flop of that, you know. Uh, kid from the South with raised by their mom, conservative Christian, African American, uh, low socioeconomic that never got spanked a day in their life. Um, but then the numbers just show us that there's going to be there's going to be kind of cultural expectations as well as a tendency within the individual uh, individual parent. Uh, what makes it more or less likely that this would occur? Um, I just realized my slides are a little bit out of order. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and go with the way that my slides are. So think about this question: What does the research suggest, or what does spanking? Right? Is it effective? Is it not? Think about that for a second while we move into this one real quick. So slide 23: uh, Challenges for caregivers, part six. Culture powerfully affects caregiving style, right? Just like we looked at with the spanking just a second ago. Um, differences apparent in multi-ethnic nations. So the United States is a really good example. We can you can see. The, the differences in parenting styles within the different cultures because of the fact we have so many cultures present here. Um, differences between majority and minority U.S. families should not be exaggerated, though. Uh, so parents of all groups usually show warmth to their children. If you're a jerk, and according to United States standards, to your, to your kids, you're probably going to be considered a jerk in almost every other culture on the planet, right? There are certain things that people are like, you just don't do that to your kids. Um, if you're harsh, Harsh, cold parenting appears harmful every group. doesn't matter where you are on the planet. Um, everyone generally agrees that that's not the way to raise kids. Okay, back to spanking. Slide 24. Um, challenges for caregivers, part 7. So spanking. Physical punishment increases obedience temporarily, but it increases the possibility of later aggression, bullying, and abusive adolescence and adult behaviors. Um... Children who are not spanked are more likely to develop self-control, basically, and then cultural influence, background, and context are notable across the U.S. and the world. Uh, personal example: I have one of my best friends growing up. Um, it was kind of a joke that he basically like didn't know what to do with himself until he got his daily spanking because he would he would you know get in trouble doing something and get spanked. Um, 
So was it effective in helping him curb his, his tendency towards rule breaking? The answer is no. In fact, um, I got in more trouble with him than I did with anybody else of, of all my friends growing up because he got really good at avoiding getting caught. So he didn't really become better. He just got better at not getting caught for doing the things that he wanted to do anyway. Um, so he had less self-control to some extent, but he got sneaky, right? Um, he was good at it. I mean, that's what, so. Now, are there times when spanking, spanking might be appropriate? Um, I'm gonna give you, this is a educated opinion from me, from the research that I've looked at uh, overall, okay? The answer is spanking should not be your go-to, okay? Uh, if you spank your kid every day, you're, you're, you're using it wrong. Um, and in fact, in some cases, you might never spank your child, right? There are, there, there are different personalities and things. This might not be something that's effective at all. But there are certain situations where I think spanking um, should be recommended. Again, as long as you're not angry, you're not doing it out of anger. You're using it as a as a corrective tool. Um, those instances are when it's a, when it's direct disobedience while they're a relatively small kid. Okay, uh, you tell them not to do something and they look at you in the eye and they do it anyway. Okay. Now the tough part with that one specifically is you it make it can make you angry if you're if you're the parent. But the direct disobedience becomes an issue because later on that can become dangerous. And that's the other time when a spanking would be appropriate, I would argue, okay? Again, this is just from my research and everything, looking at uh, the, different, the different studies that have come out. Uh, if the child is gonna do something dangerous, sometimes a spanking can be a useful thing. So it could be like, you've told them not to go out into the street and you see them running toward the street. You grab the kid and you give them a quick smack on the bottom. Um, that smack on the bottom, behaviorally speaking, speaking, now makes a, a much stronger connection with the negative action of doing a certain thing. So if they're going to be doing something like running out, running down the street, uh, putting something into a, a electrical outlet or something like that, those are times when spankings might be appropriate depending on the kid. Okay. Outside of those, I would say that spanking is a, it, it's rarely going to be an effective tool outside of those kinds of areas, right? Uh, there's other, there's alternative use or, or tools uh, that the parent can utilize to help with, with this whole caregiving thing. So that takes us to the next slide, slide 25. Uh, challenges for caregivers, part eight. Um, so some al alternatives to spanking, psychological control. This one's a tough one. So disciplinary thinking involves threatening to withdraw love and support and that relies on a child's feelings of guilt and gratitude to the parents. Okay, if you're going to choose between spanking and this one, spanking is actually the better choice, honestly. It's going to be less damaging in the long run. Um, and I'm not recommending, like you just heard me, I'm not recommending you spank very often. So don't you, this is not an effective tool. Anytime I hear, like, you know, you're at a store and you hear, um, I, I, you know, stop it or I'm going to just like leave you here, you know, or, or if you don't do this, I'm not going to love you anymore or things like that. That's damaging, like long, long-term damaging. Okay. Um, so it, it's a rough one. Okay. Interestingly enough, actually, uh, I, I had a friend that was from, he was Vietnamese. Um, and he never got, his parents never spanked him, never hit him, nothing like that. But, uh, his mom, psychological control was the big one, right? That was the tool that she chose to use, and it 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 hurt him. It hurt him bad. Like psychologically, he was he he struggled with emotional issues and things because of the fact that it, it, parents should be loving unconditionally, even when you're spanking of things. Like that, you need to reaffirm to them, "I love you." Right? I'm going to love you no matter what you do. You could be the biggest idiot in the world, and I'm going to love you anyway. But you can't do this. Okay. But if I tell you. If you don't stop doing that, I'm going to stop loving you. Okay, that that hurts. That's a rough one. Don't do that. Okay, that that damage is much longer, much deeper than spanking. Um, so other ones. Time out. Discipline. Uh, it's a disciplinary technique. I'm sure everyone's heard of this one, in which a child is separated from other people and act activities for a specified time. 
you're going to sit here and cool down for two minutes or three minutes or whatever. A lot of times they recommend doing the same number of minutes as, as the age of the child. Um, that, that's up for debate, but the, yeah, it's kind of a cool down time. The other one is going to be induction. This is a disciplinary, disciplinary technique in which parent tries to get the child to understand why a certain behavior was wrong. Listening, not lecturing, is going to be crucial. There's a Calvin and Hobbes comic that's actually perfect, right? The Calvin, the little, he's a little six-year-old kid. I don't know if you've read the comic. If you haven't, you should look it up. Best comic ever. But uh, Calvin's six-year-old boy, he just got in trouble, and his mom is talking at him. And you can tell he's talking at him. She's talking at him because that's what the little voice like lines are coming from her face. But there's this big voice bubble over, and he's like, good grief, I'm in trouble again. You know, she's just going on and on and on and on. And three, three panels of that. And then the fourth panel, it's like, oh, it looks like she's wrapping up. Better start nodding. Okay, and she's like, very good. I'm glad we had this talk. Okay, uh, she wasn't listening. She was lecturing, and that's not an effective way, right? Uh, you, you, you separate it. You just pull them to the side. And you say, all right, Johnny, um, what happened? And he explains it to you. You say, okay, uh, was that the best action? You can see if he says yes, you say, really? You know, like, are you sure? Is that going to be your final answer kind of a thing? And then you guide them through it. Then it takes a little more effort, but it through the, at the end, um, they come to the conclusion that like they, they, you know, what would be a better option than what you, my face looked ridiculous. Uh, it'd give them a lot more social cues basically and, and tools to engage with and, and interact um, in the future. And they're much more likely with that to then kind of catch themselves and, and do the, the thing that they came up with themselves instead of the hitting or whatever the action that you didn't want to be. Um, in our household, I've only we've only spanked our kids a couple times, honestly. Um, again, very rare circumstances. Uh, what we typically use is a combination of timeout and induction. We call it a cool down time, basically. When if, if our kiddo acts up and does something, we separate them until they cool down. They get they regain. If if they're screaming and stuff, they're not in a state where induction is going to work. They're not listening. They're not thinking. Right. They're just reacting. So the cool down time is basically time for them to kind of come back into themselves. And then we start talking, talking through. Um, and we found that to be a very effective tool for our kids, right? Something worth something worth experimenting with um, to see how it works with your kids if you've got them. Or if you're working with small kids, and you know that these these can be effective tools. So check it out. Okay. Slide 26. <clears throat> Becoming boys and girls, sex and gender. Uh, sex differences are biological differences between males and females in organs, hormones, and body shape, right? You're, you're a D-male. Okay, hopefully that didn't work. That, my computer's glitching for some reason. Uh, so, gender differences are differences in male and female roles, behaviors, clothes, and so on that arise from society, not biology, right? There's no biological indicator, as you can tell when you look around the world, that says that only girls can wear a skirt-like thing and men must wear pants, right? Go to Scotland, the my homeland, my family at least, uh, you got a bunch of guys wearing dresses, right? Like you get punched in the face for saying that, but kilts. Um, same thing in like in, in Southeast Asia, you got like the sarong and different things. That's a typical male dress, basically. Not a, I mean, male dress in like how you dress clothes, but also dress like it looks kind of like a dress. Um, so that, that's not a that's not a gimme, right? That's a gender expectation. In fact, in the United States, men wear pants, women wear pants, but they also wear dresses. Um, that's going to be a gender difference, an expectation that's put onto them by uh, by culture. Um, so children who identify as transgender present parents with special challenges, uh, mostly because of the fact that that a lot of times the parents aren't sure exactly how to deal with this, right? Um, you also find that, that a lot of kids are gonna they're gonna be they're gonna be experimenting some in this early age, right? Uh, just because little Johnny likes fingernail polish, or just because little Susie wants a short haircut or something, doesn't necessarily mean that they are transgender. That might come out later in life. Uh, but what it does show is typically they're they're looking at trying to figure out who they are, right? Um, and so that's important to keep in mind too. That when I hear people saying like they're they're looking at doing like sex changes and stuff for small kids, like man, that's that's don't do that, right? Uh, they can do that later on if they really want to, but small children they are they are not in a state of mind where they really know themselves in that way. 
but it's become a cool thing to have like a transgender kid. Um, don't force that upon them. Uh, and, and don't overreact on it negatively or positively, right? If you're like anti-transgender, that's your thing, but don't be like yelling at little Johnny because he wants to play with a Barbie doll or little Susie because she wants to play with trucks. Uh, that's part of, part of this age. Okay. So research, recent research suggests that most adults thought parents should encourage their children to play with toys associated with the other sex. Um, the number one group who disagreed with that one would be would were the dads uh, of sons. Okay, they were fine with their daughter. Most more more, more dads were okay with their daughters playing with um, boy toys, quote unquote boy toys, but they were a little less okay with their with their sons playing with girl toys. Um, but even then, it was the minority who were against it. Most people were fine with it. Okay. Um, now it's interesting that the things that they listed as girl toys are, are were dolls, jump rope, and wearing bracelets, which then seems kind of like a weird thing as far as the, all three of those things I did when I was a kid and I didn't think about a boy or a girl. Um, maybe that's my parents, but the, uh, the the how you play with them. So for example, we've provided we've provided boy toys and girl toys to all of our kids. Basically, I got two boys and a girl. Um, how they played with those toys was amazingly different. My sons played with toys like much more aggressively and much differently than what how my how my daughter plays with them. Um, my daughter has her own dump truck and she puts her dump truck to bed almost every night and she tucks it in with a blanket and she kisses it good night. Um, my sons on the other end with their dolls, like at one point my, when my older son was three and a half, um, he's running around using it like a sword. You know, this is a battle club. Okay, so differences in, in how you do this. Um, my daughter, she loves dinosaurs. She loves dinosaurs to pieces. And she, like, literally sometimes they break. But um, but she treats them like most little girls would treat, like, a baby doll, right? Like, that's, but she loves dinosaurs much better than her baby dolls. So, um, but yeah, differences there. Offer it both. And then just see how they how they do it, right? Um, so, 27, slide 27, sex and gender. Gender differences are pervasive and lifelong. Um, age two, gender labels begin to be used, right? There's boy things and girl things. My son, my oldest son, my, my middle son didn't do this as much, but my oldest son, uh, when he was like two and a half, three, refused, suddenly refused to eat off of anything that was pink or purple because to him, those were girl colors. He only wanted to eat off of things that were blue, green, and yellow. Those were, and orange. Those were boy colors. Red was up for debate. Um, that, that the fact that like this is a boy thing and this is a girl thing becomes very important to them in this age because again they're beginning to categorize and they're trying to figure out where do they fit like what's acceptable for them culturally and socially um, compared to the other things right age four gender assignments to toys and roles like suddenly you have boy things and girl things again much more deeply age six they're, they become little gender detectives they're they're trying to find boy girl what club do you belong to right Whose team are you on? Kind of a thing, um, and they can they can become little bigots basically during this period. <laughs> have very rigid male female roles uh, can be adopted in this in this period. Uh, even if you're flexible with them, there's a good chance that they're going to take on at least some. You know, this is a man thing to do, and this is a lady thing to do, or a woman thing to do. Um, so yeah. Uh, so it, it really comes down to that nature nurture type of a thing, right? You, we have genetic influences, biological influences of all our hormones and everything that are, are affecting us um, biologically, and then but at the same time we have this this nurture that the environment that we're raised in that kind of guides what we do with our biological tendencies, and that's going to be where this kind of falls into place. Okay, twenty eight. Um, theories of gender role development, part one, psychoanalytic theory. This is Freud, right? Uh, the phallic stage, Freud's third stage of development when the penis becomes the focus of concern and pleasure. Um, we start to recognize that we have, and this is actually where he got like the, the, the penis envy is where Freud's whole thing was, where little girls look down and go, hey, I don't got one. Why don't I have one? Okay. Uh, this, this is where Freud kind of, it's a little weird. Anyway, the Oedipus complex is another one. The unconscious desire of young boys to replace their fathers and win their mother's exclusive love. And then they... Freud didn't really do this, but people who followed Freud did. They, they, they took that and also flip-flopped it, where it's the girl who wants to replace the mother. Um, so basically what you have is a little boy uh, 
starts to realize that they are, if it's a little boy, starts to recognize themselves as, as connected with the father, right? They're in, like, there's mom. I love mom. Mom is mine. But it's all, she's also dad's. And there's a competition in their mind between the two. Um, problem being, they want to replace the father, but the problem, Oedipus, if you've ever, it's, it's a Greek play, um, tragedy where it's a, the dad tries to kill the son, but by letting him out in the field and the shepherd finds him and he grows up because there was a prophecy that he, that, uh, Oedipus would kill his father. Um, he grows up, the father thinks he took care of it because he thought, thinks Oedipus is dead. Oedipus accidentally kills his father and then ends up marrying his mother, thinking that it was just because his father was the king. He marries the mother, becomes the new king, and then eventually is told that he actually, in fact, um, married his own mother. At which point she commits suicide and he gouges his eyes out. The Greek Greek tragedy. But um, but anyway, the uh, the Oedipus complex, this is the idea it comes from, right? We, we, we want to basically replace the father. Um, what we realize, though, is that we can't we can't beat the dad. Right, a three-year-old or four-year-old boy can't beat dad. So if you can't beat him, join him, and you 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 take on that. You start to identify as as male, and so you start to take on the role that you observe the father doing. Um, and the same thing for the for the little girls, um, according to psychoanalytic theory. Okay, take it with a grain of salt. You know, throw it out, whatever you want to do. But this is just, this is one theory. Identification, considering the behaviors, appearance, and attitudes of someone else to be one's own. So we begin to identify, little boys begin to identify with the dad, little girls begin to identify with the mom, and they basically imitate what they're, what they see those uh, people doing. Excuse me. Um, getting the hiccups. 29, theories of gender role development, part two. Behaviorism, right? Conditioning kind of thing. So gender differences are, are a product of ongoing reinforcement and punishment and they're learned through all roles, values, and morals. Um, we, we are we learn a gender appropriate things basically with this. So rewarded more frequently than gender inappropriate behavior. Little boys when they play with boy toys are praised, when they play with girl toys are are you know shut down, and vice versa for the girls. Because of that, little boys are drawn to boy things and little girls are drawn to girl things is the, is the thinking here. Okay. Um, so social learning theory, again, who you're writing your paper on. Uh, extension of behaviorism. Children notice the ways men and women behave and internalize the standards they observe. So rather than getting praise necessarily, um, they, they're they looking for, again, they're kind of, who's my, who's my tribe? Who do I belong to? What is my group? And then they take on the elements of their tribe. Right, the garb, the the actions, the speaking patterns, and all those kinds of things that they associate themselves with, they take on um, in this. Okay, slide thirty: theories of gender role development, part three. Cognitive theories. Cognitive theory offers an alternative explanation for the strong gender identity that becomes apparent at about age five. Um, the gender schema, which is child's cognitive concept of general belief about sex differences. Girls start getting cooties, right? Or boys start getting cooties in this age. Um, and they're, they're wanting to disassociate themselves with the opposite sex at this point. Um, that changes later on. But yeah, at this point, you'll, you'll find that typically little boys are going to start playing with little boys. Little girls are going to start playing with little girls kind of thing. So based on his or her observations and experiences, they're looking around, seeing who's, again, who's there. Um, young children will categorize themselves and everyone else as either male or female and then think and behave accordingly. Uh, so that, you know, if I, I observe myself as male, I see my dad as male, my grandparent, my grandpa's as male, uncles, uh, family friends that are male, all those kind of things. And I, I associate that. And so because I see myself as male, I take on what I observe in them. Um, it could also be like, you know, movie actors and things like that too. What, what you are getting fed in the media, you know, you, you, if you, and this is where sometimes the negative stereotypes can come through and you become part of who you are. Um, if you learn it from the media, sometimes it's not the healthiest, most of the time, that's not the healthiest place to figure out what a male or a female should do. Okay. Okay. Uh, 31. Theories of gender role development, part four, evolutionary theory. Uh, sexual attraction is crucial for basic urge to reproduce. Uh, so kind of like a... Like a, if you've ever been around turkeys, 
even a baby turkey, they'll, they'll start to like preen themselves even before they have feathers to really do it. Um, we basically do the same thing as what this theory says. Males and females will try to look attractive to the other sex in gendered ways. So the males will basically, the young boys will be looking at and seeing who are the males that seem to be the most like, and they're doing this unconsciously. This isn't like a, I'm going to work this through. Uh, but they're going to look and see who's kind of the most successful at, you know, attraction. And they're going to imitate that. And then same for females. Females are going to be looking and seeing who's the most attractive, who's the most successful in attracting males. And they begin to imitate that in their play. Uh, but by doing that, they basically take on the roles of what they observe as male and female. So young boys and girls will practice becoming attractive to the other sex. They're not legitimately trying to attract the other sex yet. It's play. It's practice. But they do it because that's it's just a it's a it's an internal unconscious or subconscious drive. Again, these are different theories. We don't actually know 100% sure why these are. So, which developmental theory is best according to slide 32? Think about that for a second. If you want to pause this, you can think about that and and kind of ponder it through, but if not, you can just comment. <laughs> In the meantime, we're going to go ahead and do a random fact. I forgot to do these. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. We did the cats one. There's a village in Russia called uh, Sovkra. So, 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 uh, probably not how it's pronounced, but anyway. Uh, doesn't, the part doesn't matter. It's a village in Russia where every resident can tightrope walk. Um, what's really interesting about this is it, it, they've been doing this for over 100 years. Every single resident of this village can tightrope walk. Um, over a hundred years and nobody knows why no one in the village even knows why this tradition started uh, There's just a whole bunch a whole village of tightrope walkers weird. Okay, and not weird, but interesting It'd be kind of a fun place to grow up. I guess but if you like tightrope walking um, Okay, now we're moving on so that gives you some moments to think about that slide 33 challenges for caregivers part 9 Teaching right from wrong so gingers can be tough uh, sex is fairly straightforward Teaching right from wrong is a sense of right and wrong is outgrowth of bonding, attachment, and cognitive maturation. Um, small kids are going to have a harder time understanding right from wrong. Like that's just a, a, a fact, right? Um, but it's important still. It's a, it's a, it, like giving them even if it's the guiding, like you do this, you get in trouble. That's a very basic, very initial aspect of learning right from wrong um, but it, it gives you the social rules of what's acceptable and what's not okay um, so protecting cooperating and sacrificing are part of species survival so these are going to be things that are considered generally good in every society uh, innate moral impulses are strengthened through cognitive advances and peer interactions so basically we, we have a genetic tendency towards protecting towards cooperating with with other people and even sacrificing our own need or our own wants um, for the species or for the greater good of the group and things like that. Those are innate. Those are deeply in us. Um, there's a video you're going to be watching that, that kind of looks at this, uh, these early stages of, of morality. Um, and then, so this is a nature and nurture kind of a thing where then those things are then encouraged through actions and through our social play and things like that. Okay, 34. Challenges for caregivers, part 10, moral development. Um, Pro-social behaviors such as extending helpfulness and kindness without any obvious benefit to oneself uh, increases with maturity. There's a tendency towards empathy that is much higher um, with, with as you get older. You're much more likely just to do it automatically. Anti-social actions such as deliberately hurting another person, including people you have done who have done no harm, um, declines with maturity, right? You got the little baby who just like stabs the other baby in the eye with their finger or whatever. Uh, <laughs> that's not generally a good idea. Uh, the antipathy. So empathy is the positive aspect where you kind of feel it. Antipathy is where basically you don't. You don't have that connection. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it can be feelings of dislike or hatred that kind of flows out of the individual toward another. Um, that happens a lot less. Empathy happens a lot more, that, that ability to understand the emotions of another person and kind of what they're going through, um, especially if their emotions are differing from one's own. Uh, empathy becomes an important piece of that. Okay, 35. Challenges for caregivers, part 11. General type of aggression. Um, 
So there's four main types. You have instrumental. Let me see. I think there's. I have it in here somewhere. I want to... Instrumental, reactive, relational, and bullying. Uh, yeah, there's a table on page 215. Um, so if you want to like highlight that, boop, that might be a good one. Uh, or maybe because it was kind of a get back at me, right? Um, that's going to be that reactive aggression. Um, so somebody, you know, bumps you and you push them back. That would be a reaction. You're 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 reacting to the impulse. Somebody yells at you, you'll you'll back at them. Okay, that's a reactive thing. But it's it's generally it's started by the other person and then you are responding uh, to that, which with reaction. Um, relational aggression is non-physical acts. Uh, such as insults, uh, social rejection, and it, it's basically just aimed at harming the person socially. Um, and then you have bullying, bullying aggression. Uh, it's unprovoked, and so real quick. So relational aggression will be things like, you know, if you do that, I'm not going to be your friend anymore. That would be a relational aggression. Um, or just like, let's go, we're going to leave you here. Ha ha ha. Okay, that kind of stuff. That's a relational aggression. Bullying aggression is unprovoked. Repeated physical or verbal attack, especially on victims who are unlikely to defend themselves. Um, so yeah, we're gonna look at bullying more when we get into the, the middle childhood. Um, but just kind of that the bullying is it's it's there's no reason for it. There's not somebody has done something to them. They're just doing it for the sake of being mean, basically. Okay, so all forms of aggression usually become less common from ages two to six uh, as the brain matures and empathy increases. So. These forms of aggression, you're going to find them pretty common in like two-year-olds. They're not very good at it yet, thankfully, but it's there. As they get older, most people, you're going to see a decline in these things. Um, some will still show signs of it, obviously, but because you're going to still have bullies even in adulthood. But, you know, it's, it's less likely. Um, children learn to use aggression selectively, and that decreases both victimization and aggression. Slide 36, harm to children, part one. <clears throat> so injury control, injury, injury control, harm reduction, uh, reducing the potential negative consequences of behavior. Um, you're trying to basically to, to limit the amount of damage that it gets done essentially with this. More children are harmed by deliberate or accidental violence than any specific disease, especially the two to six year olds today. Okay. In the past, diseases used to be a big problem. Um, today, it's, it's generally going to be like some, an accident kind of a thing and or intentional harm. So why are young children so vulnerable? Um, impulsivity is going to be one of the things. Prefrontal cortex immaturity. If, if they, they, they basically don't think it through, they just have an impulsive action. And so they, they, you know, they want the thing and they just go for it. Or they're, they're, they're not thinking about what are the long-term negative potentials of it. Okay. So children are, are exceptionally, you know, they'll climb a tree and fall out of it because they didn't think about the fact that they might fall out of the tree. Um, and they don't look at kind of realistically what their skill level actually is. Uh, harm to children, part two, slide 37. Child maltreatment now refers to intentional harm to or avoidable endangerment of anyone under 18 years of age. It's neither rare nor sudden, right? It, it's something that kind of rises up. Most often it involves one or both parents. Uh, when you have this. So it could be neglect or it could be intentional harm. Um, there has been a, a slight drop uh, from 2000 to 2015. I have not seen the stats since since the coronavirus thing. Um, I am really afraid that, that I got a feeling it's going to go back up pretty pretty heavy. Um, there, there was a lot more reported. I know that for a fact. There was a lot more reported abuse and things uh, because there were so many people stuck at home. Like in the past, you might be, you know, you might have an abusive situation at home, but at least you got to go to school and things. But we had a year where basically that wasn't an option. So physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, and verbal abuse, emotional abuse were, were much higher during that period. Not to mention you have people who are under more stress, you know, loss of jobs and all these different things also just increases the, the, the issues there. Okay, Harm to Children, Part 3, Slide 38. Um, definitions, child abuse, deliberate actions that is harmful to a child's physical, emotional, or sexual well-being. And the, the key word there is deliberate. You're doing it intentionally to cause pain in some way, shape, or form. Child neglect is the failure to meet a child's basic physical, educational, or emotional needs. You're not intentionally hurting them. You're just, you just don't care. Okay. Uh, substantiated maltreatment is a harm or endangerment that has been reported, investigated, and reported. Uh, verified 
that's an, there's an important distinction between substantiated and reported maltreatment. So reported maltreatment means that there's harm or endangerment about which someone has notified the authorities that may or may not be true. Once it's substantiated, it means there's enough evidence to show that it is in fact true. Reported, it might be true, or it might not. All right, sorry, there was a little bit of shift there. When I went back and looked at the video, I discovered that at this point, there was a giant like snowstorm sound going on, so gotta redo this. Um, so yeah, reported, it may or may not have actually happened. Substantiated means it definitely has. Okay, um, slide 39. Harm to children, part four. Um, so the, the five to one ratio reported versus so uh, substantiated. There's, for every five reports, there are there's one substantiated case. Um, and there's, there's some reasons for that. One is that each child is counted only once. Uh, substantiation requires proof, and that's the big thing, right? Just because like I, I, could, uh, I could think that there might be something going on, so therefore I could report it, but there has to be proof to actually back that up. Um, mandatory reports are required signs of possible maltreatment. Okay. Uh, if you're a man, if you're a mandatory reporter, for example, like like we are at the college, right? If I if I if I see you some red flags, I have to report it. I'm required by law to report it. Teachers, healthcare providers, um, and there's several other groups. But they're, 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 if you're a mandatory reporter, mandatory reporter, you have to report it no matter what. Um, which means that I see a red flag, I report it, and it might just fall through, right? Um, some reports are screened out, and some reports are deliberately false. You got the jerk neighbor down the road who who reports a family just to cause problems, basically. Uh, I've only heard of that happening a couple times, uh, but you know, every now and then, you, it, it, and it's it's a form of harassment uh, that some people might do. It's kind of a bullying thing. Okay, um, forty. Armed to children, part five. Frequency of maltreatment. So not all instances are noticed, right? Maltreatment, it's, it's hard to really pinpoint when you actually got the numbers of exactly how many times a child or children in, in, the, in a given area are maltreated. Because um, it can be unnoticed, um, it can be reported, but not substantiated. Um, but typically, the, the positive trends are kind of fluctuating. I'm worried to see what happens with, with the whole COVID thing. Um, the reports I know for a fact have gone up. Uh, as well as the incidences have gone up. It's not just because the reports are going up because people are observing. It's because there actually are problems happening more often. So things to consider. Um, definitions, right? This can also affect things. How you define maltreatment is, is important. Um, national awareness, more effective reporting and prevention is, is key. Um, there's, a, there's a growing rich poor gap in families, which is causing some problems. Um, in the poor groups, there's a higher chance of it. Uh, higher groups, higher income sometimes there actually is still, I mean, there's still a chance of, of maltreatment, um, but the types of maltreatment might look different and or might be less noticeable. Um, different Differences in willingness to report is a big one. Some communities are more likely to report than others. Um, and then young ages of victims makes it challenging, right? If it's a three-year-old or a four-year-old who's being maltreated, uh, trying to pin that down can be very challenging. Uh, there are people who are heroic and they choose to make that their life work where they're, they're helping uh, basically protect small children, but it's, it's a tough one. Uh, 41, harm to children, part six. There's a, there's a little graph here. You can see it on page, boop, boop. I had to go back to where it was because I went all the way to the end. Uh, page 223, you can see this little graph. I'm gonna let you just look, look at that and read it because I know this video is already getting long. Um, 42, Harm to children, part seven, symptoms of maltreated children coincide with PTSD. In fact, sometimes it actually is PTSD. Um, oftentimes it is. But even without that, there, there's going to be similar signs. There's neurological, emotional, and behavioral uh, damage done um, that can be long-lasting. In fact, it can last their entire life if they don't get uh, additional treatment things. Even with treatment, it's still going to be a bigger uh, struggle for them than it would be for children who aren't maltreated. So harm to children, part eight, slide 43. Uh, consequences of maltreatment, effects of maltreatment are devastating and long-lasting. Uh, mistreated and neglected children uh, regard people as hostile and exploitive. So they're already kind of hardened to the world, basically, um, even at this early, early age. 
they're less friendly, more aggressive, more isolated than other children. They're much more likely to, to engage in bullying and things like that. Um, because of that, they experience greater social deficits. Even if they're not bullies, uh, they're just not as pleasant to be around. And so they don't have as much social interaction. Uh, plus, the way their brain develops, the part that, of the brain that really gets affected as far as the, the, the neurological issues is in the prefrontal cortex where their, their social skills, their social tools, their physical social tools are just not as well developed um, compared to kids who don't go or who aren't maltreated. Um, so they may experience large and enduring economic consequences. Okay. 44, uh, harm to children, part nine, preventing harm. So levels of prevention, you have primary, pre uh, primary prevention, which is the overall condition. Basically, you, you're, you, you, you change the community, you change the society um, to make it less likely for for maltreatment to occur. Okay, um, you just you, you remove the the likelihood of it happening. Secondary prevention is you you're, you're targeting specific individuals um, and who are at a higher risk and trying to change the situation um, to reduce the chances of it happening for that individual. And then tertiary prevention begins after an injury has already occurred. Right, so. The incident has happened, we know the incident has happened, and now it's damage control. We're trying to reduce the, the amount of, of, or limit the amount of damage that occurs due to that. Just in case, I, I can't remember if, I, if this made it into that part or not. Final random thing. In 2016, Jap Japan's Domino's Pizzas tried delivery via reindeer. So you, 2016 in Japan, you might have opened the door to the pizza bell, and it's a reindeer delivering your food. Okay, 45. Just in case, I wanted to make sure I, I hit that. I might, you might hear it again. I just, I, I, there was some glitching happening, so I wanted to make sure it was okay. Um, Forty-five. Harm to children, part ten. All levels of prevention require helping caregivers to provide a safe, nurturing, and stable home. Um, that's the key, right? The the family unit is the key, whether that be the actual biological parents or outside parents, like extended family or or foster care or something like that. Um, doesn't matter. It, they, we need nurturing people in this case. So when a child is removed from home and entrusted to another adult, the two options there are basically foster care and kinship. Um, you can see this on 226, 227 for more details there. Um, Harm to Children, part 11, slide 46. Our last slide, adoption difficulties. Uh, judges and biological parents are reluctant to release children for adoption oftentimes, which can make things challenging. Um, most adoptive parents refer infants, which can also be challenging, right? You want a brand new baby? rather than a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old who's coming from a, a rough background. Um, it can be a lot more difficult in that transition time if they, uh, being an older child. Um, some agencies screen out families not, not headed by heterosexual couples. So if you're living in an alternative lifestyle or things like that, even if you're a single person with a, you know, making a good income and you're wanting help, uh, a lot of times you're gonna, they're not gonna choose you. Um, some professionals insist that adoptive parents be the same ethnicity and or religion as the child. So you got to have the same skin color usually, roughly the same, you know, European, African, Asian is usually what they're looking at. Uh, they're not really looking at the, they're, they're, it's broad strokes there. Um, and then the same similar religion, uh, which can, can make things challenging. You know, if you have like an African, you know, or an African descent, uh, child from a Muslim family say, it can be challenging to find a, a fit for them here in the United States um, or Buddhist, Asian, things like that, right? There's, there's some challenging things. Anyway, that's that. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that you learned something in this. It was a longer video uh, this time. So hopefully something good came out of it. But anyway, uh, let me know if you have any questions and I will do my best to answer them. Uh, until next time, I, in, the next one, in the next one, again, remember to do the quizzes. In the next chapter, we'll be going to chapter seven, look at moving up into middle childhood, where we're looking at approximately age seven until adolescence, 11, 12 years old, give or take, um, and kind of looking at what's going on in that period of life. And so until then, have a great day, great evening, great whatever time it is you're watching this. I will see you all in the next video. Have a great one.